Okay, everybody, let's go ahead and get started. Um, thanks for coming tonight to the second uh, series of Cons uh, Corinthian Sailing Association seminars that we're doing both in person here at Pontchartrain Yacht Club and uh, to the rest of the world on Zoom. Uh, we did six seminars last year. We have uh, four of them are now on a YouTube channel and we expect to get the uh, remaining seminars on the YouTube channel shortly. I'll send an email out to everybody with the um, YouTube channel link on it so that you can look at it. I think we had some really good seminars last year. They were well attended. Um, and you can go back if you missed them and um, review them and see what's there. Um, we plan to do more seminars this year. We, last year we plan to do more seminars and to do some um, in the water type things associated with the seminars. It turned out to be a little bit harder to coordinate the in the water things because of the limited number of boats available. So we're gonna look at how we can do that better this year. Um, it was things like anchoring, man overboard stuff, docking and getting away from a dock, stuff like that. So we can't have 15 boats lined up here at the seawall easily but we're working on ways to, to do that. So those things will happen over the year. This is the first of our series of events and it's um, Chris Friend, who I'll introduce in just a second, is putting it on for us. This is a basic racing rules seminar that's aimed at um, us. It's for people who do not race um, their boats every weekend, who are not practicing during the week, and are not 100% up to speed on all the racing rules. The idea for this is to make sure you know the basic rules so that you can get around the course without fouling another boat, or worse, having a collision. Um, what we're trying to do this year, um, that we've done in the past, but we're gonna do it more aggressively this year, is promote the Lake Pontchartrain Racing Circuit, LPRC, which is probably the best series of races that are held on Lake Pontchartrain or, or locally in the area. We want to get more Corinthian boats to participate in LPRC <laughs> and what we're going to do is try and get all of you familiar with things that, um, that you'll encounter on LPRC. One of them is timed starts. We've been doing practice timed starts here on the North Shore and we're going to be doing some more of those. Then as we get closer to LPRC, you will already have seen this seminar you'll have the handout available to you and you'll have your rules book. We're going to go into a little bit more detail on the main rules that you need to be familiar with on LPRC. Another thing that we're going to do is we're going to go over the sailing instructions from last year, which will probably be very similar to the sailing instructions this year, so that there's absolutely no confusion about how the line's going to be set up, how the course is going to be set up, what class you need to enter your boat into if you're um, a typical Corinthian boat and all the things that you need to understand so that you are comfortable going to the starting line in LPRC with 10 or 15 other boats on the line who are all trying to get at the same spot at the same time. But if we work this out right, you'll know that everybody doesn't have to be at that same spot at the same time and it, it can be well to your advantage to start somewhere else where you've got clean air, boat speed, and nobody in your way. So we're, the goal of all of these racing things is to work through to get you better equipped to race all the time, but also so that you'll get interested in going out and sailing LPRC, which can be a lot of fun because of the good races, the good competition, and the good parties afterwards. Another thing that we're gonna try and do with our uh, seminars is focus on cruising. We've got a bunch of boats um, that are interested in cruising, either instead of or in addition to racing, and we're going to uh, promote some things that, um, that go along with cruising. The problem is, is trying to find the time to get all the seminars in. So, so that's what our goal is for the year. And we're gonna start off the, um, tonight with this what I'm gonna call basic racing rules, but it's very fundamental stuff that you need to know. And the person who's volunteered to do this, you probably know, is Chris Friend. Chris Friend's been a member of Pontchartrain Yacht Club for 15 years. But Chris has basically been sailing all of his life and racing all of his life. He started sailing prams when he was 10 years old, 
and he's been sailing ever since. He grew up racing flying scots and lasers on the South Shore as a junior member at Southern Yacht Club. He was on the Yale sailing team at a time when Yale was a dominant player in um, collegiate racing. Uh, so he sailed every day against some of the top competition in the country. Uh, he sailed on um, Sunfish, Snipes, J24s, 470s, and he's also sailed in a lot of different PHRF things. He's a U.S. Sailing Certified Regional Race Officer, which means he has a lot more knowledge about how the racing rules are done, how regattas are organized than the average racing person that you run into. He's been a Principal Race Officer, or PRO, for One Design and Handicap Fleets here on the Lake Pontchartrain. Um, he's also been active in Gulf Yachting Association. So please welcome Chris Friend. Thank you, Skipper. You're welcome. Um, and thanks for coming. Um, today we're just going to cover some real. There, there are a lot of slides here, but we're going to we're only going to wade about toe deep into it. Anybody who's not seen this before, this is the US, this is the racing rules of sailing which is uh, uh, printed by U.S. Sailing, but it's also organized by World Sailing, uh, with, and this has U.S. prescriptions in it. Looks like a big book. We're going to be covering about that much of it. <laughs> okay? And of all these pages, most of the pages have to do with one rule, and that's the room at the mark rule. We'll get into that later. Um, but... Um, I wanted, for, I wanted to start off with a couple of slides to show you the kind of things that you, uh, might, you might have seen before. This is the start of, the, uh, of, of a race in uh, Australia called the Sydney to Hobart race. And the, the big ones you see there are over 100 feet long. Each one of those tiny little sailboats is bigger than any, lake on, any boat on this lake. So they all had to get to the starting line the same way that you have to get there. Just like these J boats here, which are 130 feet long, they take longer to, to, to respond, and we'll talk about response times later, about when you get close to other boats, how, how, much, how close is too close. How close is too close is pretty far away when you're in a J-boat. And there also might be a situation where there are a lot of boats on the line. This is the Sunfish Worlds last year in Italy. It would have been great to be there. There were 91 boats on that starting line. You're not going to see that on the lake. But you are going to see a rather crowded starting line if you sail in LPRC or if you also sail on the Wednesday nights uh, sailing on the South Shore. Uh, how many, how many, I think the most number of boats they've had is 75. I don't know what they're looking 40. at. Now. They're looking at around 40 right now. It's, it's, a, it's uh, supposedly a pretty uh, low key event, but I think some people take it pretty seriously. <laughs> so, this is, again, this is around the race course. So we are going, this, uh, this presentation was originally for judges who, who are brushing up on the rules or are trying to get certified. So it's from US Sailing. Um, but what, this, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna go very briefly under the fun, on, uh, talk about the fundamental rules uh, and then talk about going around the race course from the start up the beat, around the windward mark, and then on going downwind and finishing. And we're not going to talk about uh, sailing instructions. We're not going to talk about entering races or protests or appeals or anything like that. We're just going to get everybody around the race course safely. So that's, that's the first and most important thing is safety. If somebody is out there in trouble, you are required, rule one, you are required to render assistance. And that should be pretty common sense to anybody who's sailing in this group. Um, I've, I've done that before. I've rescued somebody in a sunfish before. Um, I think that probably somebody on each boat in this, in this uh, who's here has done something like that. Um, second, and also you have to have life jackets and have to wear them when appropriate. Um, I'm not going to get into when that should be, because it's basically your decision about what you're gonna, whether you're going to wear a life jacket or not. Uh, but it's coming down the pike where it's going to be required, probably, in the near future. Fair sailing. Don't cheat. Be nice. Um, decision to race. 
It is your decision <coughs> whether to start a race or to continue a race. Doesn't matter what the conditions are, doesn't matter uh, you know, what the race committee tells you to do, doesn't matter what your, what your uh, other competitors are saying what you should do. Everybody on a boat gets to decide whether they're going to continue or not. That's an important situation when it comes to liability too, but again, I'm not going to go there. And lastly, when you sail in a sailboat race, when you enter the race, you are implicitly accepting the rules. And these rules are above and beyond the uh, international regulations for prevention of collisions at sea, um, which do come into account on a couple of different situations. One is when you are no, when you are no longer racing, those are in effect. Uh, as long as you're not around other boats who are racing, and we'll get into that in a second. And secondly, there are some races, and I believe the uh, New Orleans to Gulfport and Gulf to Pensacola race do this, where at sun between sunset and sunrise, the racing rules turn off. They, but that has to be written into the sailing instructions. Do you happen to know, David, whether yeah. they do that? In those, <clears throat> in those races, when when the sun goes down. And, and, and certain, I'm not going to go into it. Like he's not going to do a lot of you. If you do those races, you'll know it'll be there. You're not allowed to run a boat up. Yeah. Quick the, story. The, all, Quick. all of those. Things. Ben Fraser and I were 330 miles offshore, going to ease of my hair. He wanted to protest me for running him up. <laughs> Literally. That's so, it. but you can't, you can't luff a boat if they had that rule in. All right. So that's that's just if you know if if they say so. But if you're not racing, if you go out sailing right now and you're and you go near another boat, and they're not racing, these don't count. These are not in effect. Just go hit them. Um, common sense. Captain to captain. That's right. So we're going to talk about some definitions first. Keeping clear just means that a right of way boat doesn't have to do anything doesn't have to anticipate what you're going to do. And that's a, that's a key, key thought there. If I'm on starboard tack and you're on port tack or, and I'm sailing along, you have to stay out of my way. I don't have to do anything to, I don't have to say anything to you. You, you have to keep, you have to make sure that you check to see that I'm there and don't hit me. I don't have to start getting out of your way unless it's obvious that you're going to hit me. Um, but that's important. Right. You do not have to anticipate any other boat's actions. Um, and secondly, when two boats are overlapped, does everybody, does anybody not know what overlapping means? I'm going to go to the board here for a quick second. Is this thing going to follow me? No. But the videos are, so go okay. ahead. So if you have two boats, <laughs> down, okay, like that. Got it. Okay. These boats are not overlapped. Ex explain why, so the people listening. So, The boat ahead and the boat astern. Boat A, if you draw a line parallel to the transom, this 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 boat that's astern, or this is the overtaking, this is the overtaken, it is behind that line. These boats are now overlapped. It, all it takes is just to be across that line. And likewise, if, you know, at any point, it doesn't have to be to windward, it can be leeward. they're overlapped. So we'll talk about what rules go into effect when. Give me a favor, draw it where a bigger boat's going through the lead of, of a boat. That, that's the problem. Draw it where, where you got a, a lure boat going through the lead of, a, of, a, of another boat. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, bigger boat there. What about that boat? Well, they overlap. Well, they are yeah, overlap. That close. And that 
Lord Boat has no right away because he's too close to give him right away. To well, vote. We'll, we'll get into that. In a okay. Minute. We'll get into that in a minute when when we have, you know, what the what there's there's the right away boats have, you know, have privileges, but they also have restrictions, and we'll get into that in a minute. But the second thing about overlap is when boats are overlapped, the right away boat can change course in both directions without immediately making contact. And that gets into what David just was talking about. So if, if, if uh, that means that, that the other boat has kept clear of them. So if, if I came up right next to Skipper and I just turned a little bit and I hit him, then I'm wrong, even as a right away boat. And likewise, if he came up to me and was the burden boat and the same thing happened, he'd be wrong. So that's, that's keep clear. Room is the space a boat needs in the existing conditions, including space to comply with her obligations while maneuvering promptly, promptly and in a seaman-like way. Let's talk about both of those things. If, if somebody comes up below you at a mark, or let's say somebody comes up uh, below you as, an over, as a lured boat, then the windward boat has to keep clear of you, and they have to immediately start getting clear of you. They can't wait one, two, three. They can't delay. They have to immediately start doing it. And secondly, it's seaman-like now. That gets into some very interesting situations when you have short-handed boats. If I have a full crew and you're sailing single-handed and you can't stay out of my way because you're sailing single-handed, you can't use that as an excuse. <coughs> if I have the right of way and you don't. You can't, if, if you're an inside boat going around a mark and you take too much room because you can't trim the sails tight enough, and you're only and you're single-handed, double-handed, and I have five or six people on my boat. That's not an excuse. So, in a single or double-handed event where everybody's in that situation, it's a totally different thing. But that's what seaman-like is. If so, it's important for everybody to have competent people on board. That takes practice. I know. I've been in many situations where I've totally embarrassed myself by capsizing or running into somebody because I made a stupid mistake. Everybody does it, but it does not. It does not mean you're right because you can't do it because you can't. So, mark room is another thing we'll talk about. Mark room is room for a boat to leave a mark on the required side, and in this slide here you'll see that in position one, uh, the blue boat is the inside boat and the orange boat is the outside boat. The orange boat must give the blue boat enough room to get around the mark. And in this case, the windward boat happens to be, I mean, it's a windward boat. Normally in a free leg of the course, the windward boat has to keep out of the way of the leeward boat. But when you're getting around the mark, the rules change, and we'll get into what that means when we talk about mark room in more detail later. But this is just the room that it requires. If the win if the windward boat needs to jibe, then I mean, if the inside boat needs to jibe, then it's room to jibe as well. Can't be so close. So if the boom comes across and hits the outside boat, the outside boat would be wrong in that case. That's what the mark circle works. three boat lengths, right? Yeah, the zone is three boat lengths and. Quick aside, it's three boat lengths of the boat that enters the zone first. It is not the larger boat or the smaller boat. If, 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 uh, you know, if, if you're sailing your 40 foot boat and you're 120 feet away and I'm sailing my sunfish and I get there within 30 feet and say room, I'm, I, no, I can't get room for you. No, and, that's a that's a big difference, but you have smaller differences out there, if, especially in a pursuit race when you've got, you know, boats that are catching other boats very quickly. Like the boats behind, you might have a 40 foot boat behind a 30 foot boat. The 30 foot boat gets in the zone. The 40 foot boat says, "I want rooms." Like, no, I when I got here, 
it was back there and you didn't have room. So it's whichever one gets to the zone first. So here's, here's um, a situation where it's room for a boat to sail to the mark when her proper course is to sail close to it. So in this case, this blue boat has to sail down, so the orange boat is going to have to get out of its way. Any questions about that? And then room to round the mark as necessary to sail the course. Now, the, this is a note here. I was talking about seaman-like. Seaman Notice here that two in, in position two, blue is getting ready to go around the mark, but goes very, very wide. <coughs> Orange has given them plenty of room, but blue still is very wide. In this case, blue is, is, is wrong. Blue may have decided to do that because from a, from a tactical standpoint, they wanted to go wide on one side and, and, and close on the other. In this case, they can't do that. Chris, can you slow down and go up inside of it? Well, you mean, can, can the orange boat do that? Yeah. As long, yeah, if they want to slow down and go behind three and, and go behind their stern and get inside, yes, it's a very common situation, especially when you have what's, what is affectionately known as a pinwheel. So and you have a whole lot of boats that are, that are marked and they all start to drift downwind. Boats that are coming in from behind can take the chance of going in there. But there's also, Rick, the chance that boat three might decide to luff up, in which case, I'm sorry, but the blue boat might decide to luff up if, if, uh, if the orange boat well, wait, tries I'll, to go inside. If I'm swinging inside and I'm slowed down, and he's still out wide, how do you know I can't overlap him on the inside? How can he all of a sudden come up on me then? Well, you're inside the zone. On well, the overlap <coughs> has to happen before you get in the three length zone. Uh, okay. So if once right. once you get to the three length, length zone, the situation, it's a snapshot in time. If you do not have an overlap on me, when I get to the three uh, uh, boat length zone and I screw up my mark rounding and you try to go inside me and I, I and then I go up to get close, you're wrong and, and okay. I hit you I or you. if you hit the mark, you're wrong. Okay. So, yes, it's defined when you and when the lead boat enters the zone. Any other like questions? Nightmare <clears throat> of all the regards I've lost. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, let's talk about what a tack is. You're either on starboard or port tack, and that corresponds to the wind, the side that the wind is going across. Unless you're going straight downwind, in which case it's the side that you're it's opposite the side of your boom. So the leeward side is the side your boom is on, the other side is the windward side. Does everybody understand that? <laughs> okay. So all right, same I'm sorry, Chris. Same scenario. He slowed down a little bit for whatever reason. And I'm coming in hot. Are oh, you talking about going around the mark again? Around the mark okay, again. Back. Yeah. I'm coming in hot. That could be a 30 foot boat. Blowing 16. I'm going a little bit faster. I'm allowed to come around that mark. Now I get to the point where he maybe gets a little bit more power. I'm coming around the mark. My guys are trimming in, doing what they're doing. He gets a little bit ahead of me. Now, at what point can he tank in front of me? Well, okay, so let's not, let's try to keep the, the rules, the, the situations apart, because one of them is rounding the mark, and the other one is on attack. Okay, but, so. But you're talking about tax, and that's, that's so what I'm saying. If, if you are still well, inside of the three boat circle, that's why I'm asking. Okay, I, I, okay, so if you're inside the, once you have rounded the mark, the, the rule about mark room turns off. Okay. All right, fair enough. Okay. Fair enough. Once you, when, if you're both around the mark, then it's a matter of, you know, you're, 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 let's say you're leaving it to port, you're on port tack, you want to go on a starboard, 
you look over and say, do I have room to tack at that point? If you do, in your view, in your opinion, go ahead and tack. But you got to watch out for tacking too close, because if you tack too close, then you're wrong. You've got, you cannot, a and boat on a the A boat on a tack has a right of way over a boat that is tacking. Gotcha. And a boat that is tacking is from head to wind until you're on close haul course. So until you're head to wind, you're not tacking. You're just luffing, gotcha. you're going up. So if there's an inside boat, you know, let's go to the board again. <laughs> Here we go. All right. Wind is wind is coming from the top of the board. You're good. Okay. <coughs> this boat is on port tack. This boat is on port tack. And let's say that's one, that's two. You're still on port tack. Three, you are now tacking. Four, you're still tacking. I wish I could tack that time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming really, really narrow jibs. Okay. Let's assume that that is a that this that you're on it. That is your close hard course. Now you're on starboard tack. But at, at three and four, at, at three and four, you're you're tacking. You're not on neither tack. And on one and two, you're still on four tack. So that's that's the way the rule is written. So what happened? Because he didn't forward all the whole time. It's a lot of current. <laughs> so what happens if you're hit while you're tacking? What's that? What happens if you're hit while you're tacking? If you're not... you are tacking, you have to keep clear of a boat that is on a tack. On a tack. Okay. So even a, so, if you're tack, if you're going from starboard to port, as long as you're on starboard tack, which is in positions one and two, okay. you still have the right of way. Okay. But once you hit head to wind, you are tacking, and now you have to keep clear of a boat that's on a tack. Okay. And once you get up, once you're on starboard, then, you know, you're on attack. So if there's another, you know, if there's a port tack boat coming, they have to stay out of your way. There might be a boat to lure it of you. You have to stay out of their way. I mean, all the rules. And that's when you get to yell, starboard, starboard, starboard. You can, but you don't have to. You know. <laughs> but it's more fun to do it that way. Yes. Okay. All right. So on opposite tacks. Any more? Then, that? Got it. Okay. Okay, rule 10. On opposite tacks, we got into that. Port tack boat shall keep clear of a starboard tack boat. So, also, when boats are on opposite tacks, a port tack boat shall allow a starboard tack boat to sail her course with no need to take avoiding action. Okay, so if you're crossing. If you're on port and you're crossing a starboard tack boat, you have to make sure that there's enough space so that they don't have to do anything. It's very simple. Now, if you're on port and you, you know you, you know your boats pretty well, so I'm assuming you'll you can figure out whether you're going to cross somebody or not. And we won't get into techniques to figure that out at all. Just that's the way the rule is written, and that's that's what it has to be. Chris, yes. Go back to this. Put, put a mark off the stern of boat five. Yeah. Okay. Go further back. Oh, you want an actual mark? You're rounding a mark. There's another boat coming down the way. Got it. A mark right there. Yeah. And there's a boat coming down the way. Stop. Yeah. What's happening? Yeah. Well, you want to be on port or starboard? Oh, I'm thinking there would be. Well, where? Okay, what do you want? To... I'm looking at five. Okay, so five is on starboard tack. You want me to raise the other one? Let's get rid of these. Yeah, okay. okay, so you've gone around Mark, and there's a boat 
Dead, 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 Where's the boom? Do you want it over there or there? I, I would want it. Okay, let's let's do this. Okay, what tack are they on? Start. Wind is straight behind, but wait a minute. No, that boom. Four tack. Four tack. Four tack. Four tack. Four tack. You're by the lead. Four tack. And so, okay, so this is a starboard tack boat, that's a port tack boat, right? Who has a right away? Oh, oh, there's that, there's that room, is that three boat legs? That, so they're on different mark, they're on different legs of the course, okay? So there's no mark room situation at all. The, 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 the room at the mark rule, it will only be in effect for this boat and other boats that are on the same, the same way. This boat has already gone around. And actually, you'll see this a lot. When boats going, you know, coming still coming downwind. I'm glad you brought it up. Other boats going upwind. This boat is starboard tack has right over everybody, right away over anybody coming downwind. Now what we're going to do is this. We're going to put this boat. This boat is already jived. Now it's on starboard tack. This boat's on starboard tack. Who has a right away? The bigger boat. The bigger boat. <laughs> 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 this I'm boat, because it is the lured boat, you are correct. Lured has right away over at windward. So, now, realistically, when this happens, remember what I said about safety before. Um, this, is, this is why it's very important to have somebody watch what's going on, because when you get often get situations, especially in LPRC, but there's a big crowd of boats coming around the lured mark while there's still boats coming down on the run. Um, they typically on the beat will set an offset mark so that it doesn't happen at the windward mark where you'll have to go around the windward mark, sail and reach for about a few boat lengths and then turn and put up a spinnaker if you have spinnakers or just turn and go downwind. But when you get to the lured mark, typically you don't have that. You, ha you have to be watching out. And, and they don't use offset marks for the PHRF. Well, they, I think for, for the classes that you're talking about, they typically do triangles, big triangles. So you, won't, you typically won't have a situation in the class, what's called, I think they call it the classic fleet, where you ju you'll just sail a big 12 mile triangle so that it's unlikely that you'll have a situation like this. But in the other classes, they often have this. And in dinghies with 90 boats or something like that. They'll, they have other ways of trying to keep boats away from each other, but it's a common problem where you, you, you have boats coming down and you've got to watch out. We're going to take turns. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. We're still in, we're still in, uh, we're getting into rules more, but uh, these, we're still in, uh, definitions here. Let's talk about obstructions here. An obstruction is something that you could not pass without changing course substantially if you were one boat length away from it. Typical thing is, you know, an anchored boat, um, a, uh, you know, is, is you know, uh, another, a, boat, a right away boat. So if you're on port tack, a starboard tack boat, could be an obstruction. However, a boat that's underway is not a continuing obstruction. That is, you, we'll get into what continuing is later, but it's you, like you can't use it as a pick, basically. You, you either go, you go past it and that's it. Um, so a starboard tack boat is an obstruction to a port tack boat going upwind if Two, if one boat is trying to go around it with another boat close nearby, like for example, I know I'm. Thank you, Scott. Here's a starboard attack boat. Here's a windward port tack boat and a lured port tack boat. Mm -hmm. 
this boat wants to go, the lured boat wants to go behind, let's say they want to go behind the starboard tack boat. The windward boat is going to hit them. They ask for room at that boat because it's an obstruction. That is allowed. Really? Yes. Yeah. That's a, that's what a, lawyer came up with this idea? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you should put yourself in position. This boat, tack off. this boat is set. Okay, well, I'll get into that in a second. If but this being the lured boat, it can decide if they want to tack instead. They can say, "I have." Let's say they're. Let's say it's more like this, <laughs> right? They want to tack here. This lured boat can say. I have an obstruction, I want to tack and can force that boat about. <clears throat> we'll get into that more with the. Uh, it almost sounds like the old tack or cross scenario. Well, you know. So, anyway. The, but that obstruction can't be moving, right? Well, the, the, this is, yes, yeah, this yeah, boat yeah. is moving. That is moving. To but it is a right of way boat that both of these boats have to stay out of the way. And so this boat here can decide whether they're going to tack or duck. If this boat decides they're going to tack, this boat has to stay out of their way. If this boat decides to duck, then the windward boat can then say, I want room to duck as well. The, the, um, they cannot cut them off. And you can't say... I want to tack and force that boat to tack and then and then not tack. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's that's not <laughs> kosher. I just <laughs> spill my rum. You couldn't tax. I couldn't spill my rum. Okay. 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 okay, so it must be large enough to require a substantial course change. And so we talked about that. Okay, so here's, here's another, here is um, a situation at the start. So the green boat is luffing head to wind, was on starboard tack and is just about head to wind, but let's assume that they're not quite head to wind. So they're, they're just checking, they're about to check the wind direction for the start. Uh, that's the green one. The blue and orange are coming along. So who has rights and what rules apply? Well, as lured right away boat, blue decides which side of green she wants to go on. And that's basically what I said a second ago. In this situation, if, if, if blue decides to go below green, then let's go back. If blue decides to go below green, then it has to give orange room. If, if blue decides to go above green, then orange just needs to stay clear, both of them, because they're a windward boat. And this happens a lot on starting lines. Uh, before the start, boats are going back and forth. Boats are coming down from the committee boat end towards the pin end, and there'll be a boat that's sitting, going very slowly. You know, this will happen in a big fleet. Just be aware that you need time to do it. So blue chooses the side, and if they if they so desire, if they do go below it, then they do have to give orange room at that at that obstruction, which is basically a stopped boat. And orange would have to have to relay that to the blue boat, right? Orange would have to hail, yes, for room. Now, is green allowed to go between those two boats? So blue is an obstruction. So to, as blue is an obstruction as both orange and green are required to keep clear of blue. Blue is not a continuing obstruction because it's a vessel underway. So it depends. <laughs> when green overlaps orange, she must initially give orange room to keep clear. So green is going to what side of orange? 
lured side becomes a lured vote. When you're a lured vote, you have right of way, but you have to give the windward vote an opportunity to stay out of your way. It gets back to what I said before about me coming up too close to Skipper and not, he's not, he does not have a way, uh, uh, enough room to stay away from me. So orange must keep clear and give green room to pass between her and blue if she is able to when the overlap begins. Again, this is a starting area situation which could happen. This is one of the most interesting things about starting. We're getting into what's called the barging, the anti-barging rule. Barging is not defined in the rule book. It's something that it's just a name that people have given to a situation. So in this case, we've got two boats that are approaching the starting line, probably pretty close to the time of the start, uh, starting signal, but not quite. It's still before the start. So what happens? So in this situation, blue is, was started off ahead of, ahead of orange. And before they get to the committee boat, she luffs up head to wind. She can do that as a lured boat, as long as she does, as long as there's enough room for orange to get out of their way, but she cannot, she, she has to start doing it before orange gets between them and the committee boat before the start. Yes. Does she have to have established being clear ahead? Is that still a term that you use these days? Clear ahead is a term, but in this, in this situation, the, she's not clear ahead. She's, she's just sailing up from trying to prevent orange from getting between them and the start and the committee boat for a start. She's trying to get the windward start, in other words. And so she is heading up and saying no room because before the start, there is no room at the mark. It, it just doesn't exist. Not until after the starting signal is there room at the mark. Um, so if, if blue luffs up before orange gets between the committee boat and, and, the, uh, and, and them, then it's fine. However, if she waits, let me see. If orange is already between the committee boat and, and the blue boat, it's still, it's not a room at the mark situation. It's simply when we're lured. And there's a rule that says that if, if you're gonna love somebody up, they have to have room to get out of your way. Mm -hmm. And in this case, orange would not have any room. So blue cannot love up. Now, what does this mean with big heavy boats? This means that if you're gonna try to get that windward end start and, and there are other boats there, you've gotta make sure before you get to the committee boat that you are very assertive in trying to get to that windward position. If a boat gets between you and the committee boat, then you cannot shut the door and make them hit the committee boat. But if you've already started heading towards the committee boat before they get there, then you're, then you're fine. So can the orange boat call obstruction on the committee boat? No. Okay. <laughs> it's not from, obstruction. From okay. the last scenario, it seems like a bunch of yes to me, but that's, that's the new rules, I guess. But okay. In this case, it's not an obstruction. The rule 18 does not apply at, at, the, at the start. At the start. Okay. Okay. This is to prevent boats from doing exactly that, from coming down and saying, I want room at the start. And then actually, this, is, this rule has been around for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Same thing applies to the other end of the line. Even though it's a mark, think about whether you'd want to hit M1. <laughs> <laughs> but if it's uh, if or it's uh, or L1. what or L1. I wouldn't know anything about that. <laughs> Ouch! But, but uh, cool. cool. But if it if it is a, if it's just a buoy, it doesn't matter if it's just a buoy or if it's or you know, there's sometimes in some race some uh, race committees, especially for dinghies, will set two two marks to be your uh, two buoys to be the uh, starting line with their committee boats outside of it. 
it doesn't matter. If it's a starting mark, you don't have room unless, I mean, you're not going to have room, but if, if you're between the mark, the mark and another boat and it starts to go up, you can say, you, 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 uh, you can't hit me up. But likewise, sometimes a committee boat will put a buoy that extends their boat to keep from having a collision here too. Correct? As long as they say in the sailing instructions that that's, that's what's going on, then yes. But you can't just drop one over the side. <laughs> I understand. Commit the, but that, that gets into race management. Um, but in this case, you can see that, that red is telling green no room. So here's before and after. So this is a transition at the starting line before and after the starting signal. So it depends on whether you're coming up behind them or whether they came up to you. Okay. If you're on, if you're the lured boat here on the, on the left side, orange, it starts out behind blue, in which case it can, as a lured boat, it can luff up as she pleases slowly, but luffs up and then eventually starts. The right situation over here is a different situation. Blue, the lured boat starts off behind orange. So they establish their overlap to lured. So at the start, once the start happens, they can't sail above their proper course as a lured boat establishing an overlap from behind. So they cannot bluff the orange boat into the committee boat or above the line for that matter. Any questions about that? This has to do with limitations on being lured boat and windward boat. And we'll talk more about that on a free leg of the course. But um, again, the safest thing to do is just try to stay away from other boats at the start, but, but assert your rights at the start so that other people don't take advantage of it. Um, it's difficult to get a start. So that's at that's the time end. when you would be saying, screaming, coming up, and they have to respond. Right. If the lured boat is coming up, yeah, get if, your ass out of the way. If, if on the left, on the left, the orange boat came up from behind on the windward side of it. So the, the, this boat establishes an overlap to windward. So the, or, the blue boat can luff up as she pleases all the way to head to win, even after the starting signal, because it's a lured boat. The situation on the right is slightly different. The, lured, the, the, the blue boat can luff up, but, but once, once the starting signal happens, the blue boat cannot sail above their proper course. And we'll talk about proper course in a minute, but basically when you're starting, that's typically on a beat. So you can't sail above close haul because the fastest way to the next mark is to be on a beat. So you cannot go above close haul, you know, at the start. But, but some boats point better than other boats. Well, so that's their proper course though. If they point higher than you do because they can, then that's, you know, then they can do that. You know, with, with Amelia's very short wing keel, I am not going to start to windward of a Melgis 32. <laughs> well, I won't be there for long anyway. But. <clears throat> take, take the right hand scenario. The, the boat, the, the orange boat coming in more on a reach, coming in hot and hard enough right on the stern of the committee boat. You're basically changing the path. At, at, at what point does the right away change? So the right away never does change. Oh, well, um, in this case, the, the um, well, actually, the very first one, position one, we got a clear ahead, clear astern. So the orange boat actually has the right away. Once the blue boat passes that line, they become an overlap boat to lure. They become a lured boat. But there are limitations. That boat, can, first of all, that, you know, before the start, but, but, they're nowhere but, near the committee boat. Change the position of the number four position of the orange boat. Okay. 
change it to more of a reach. You mean heading down towards the blue one? I'm coming across the stern of the committee boat. Okay. So let's assume let's assume that um, so this is you know before and after the starting signal. So we can talk about before or after the starting signal. Before the starting signal. So in this case, if there's if there's enough room for them to do that, they can they can head down as long as they stay clear of, of, of blue. Because blue is a blue boat. Yeah. But when the gun goes off, he's got to sail his proper course and they can sneak in and do what they want to do. If there's room to do something. Well, so. so so here's the thing. If if, if so because blue has come come in from behind to leeward, at the starting signal, they have to fall off onto a beat. They cannot luff up above a beat, above colossal course. Before the starting signal, there is no proper course. So they can head up as high as they want, all the way to head to wind if they so choose, as long as they do it early enough, you know, so they're not, um, they're not gonna, you know, get, if this uh, orange boat ends up between the committee boat and the blue boat, then that's as high up as the blue boat can push the orange boat. Well, it, it's a scenario, my passage 42 and a Melges 32, and the Melges 32 is going to be gone by the time I get there. I can sneak in and go. Well, He's going to be three, three boat lengths ahead of me at that point, you know, so you can you well, can if, come in late and still do okay. Yes. At the windward mark. Yeah. If a, a late start is a common tactic because then you don't have the traffic around you. Right. Uh, especially if you want to go to that side of the course and you want to go right or whatever. Um, or if you know that the boat below you can't point as high as you can, that's also a tactical thing. But from a rule standpoint, you know, if you're coming in high up here, you're very vulnerable yeah. because it's because you're, you're just very vulnerable, and it's a, it's not a good idea to do that. <laughs> So here's, you know, we, we talked about the, uh, this, this is at the starting line as, as the start happens. So you could see here in position one, you know, uh, orange is well, well astern of blue. Then in position two and three and four, but this is the start signal, you know, the start signal has happened. Blue can stay up above proper course because orange has come up, come from behind and windward. However, in this situation, blue has come in from behind. So can only go what, at the starting signal. They have to fall off onto the onto a beam and cannot sail any higher than that. So it's mostly the overlap thing. Yeah. It has yes. Well, it's it's. You're either clear it's, ahead or you're not. Well, yeah, in, so. in this case, you know, we got clear ahead, but in this case here, blue has come in from behind to lure. Establish lure overlap from behind. So they, they're limited. You know, they, they can luff, again, luff orange up until the starting signal. Once the starting signal happens, then they have a proper course. Because they came in, from behind, they can't sail above their proper course and have to fall off onto a beam. Or reach, suppose, suppose it's a reaching start, and you, you know, yeah. you, which can happen out here. You know, you, you well, hold you people up and then you head down and, and you know, head towards the jet. orange boat. The orange boat could be a uh, Catalina 27 and the other boat's a Islander 36 or whatever, you know, and so it's, it's going to be faster because the mass is taller, yeah. you know, given the same wind. But, but another thing to talk, and I'm glad you brought the two different types, those two different types of boats, because one of them is going to be, is going to respond a lot faster than the other in that case. So if you are a cat, if you're on a 27 foot boat that turns quickly and, and, and you come up, or let's say I'm on a boat that turns quickly and I come up behind you and say, start coming up, you're going to turn your, you can say, look, my helm's over. The boat's not responding. This is as fast as it goes, because that's what windward passage does. Turn slowly, right? Yeah. You know, I can come up in a sunfish and go bam, straight head to wind. I can't do that. I've got to, I've got to give you opportunity to get out of the way. 
By the same token, as I said earlier, you can't wait to start turning. You have to start turning right away. So is it, if in that case you would want to protest, do you say, my helm's over? Well, so they know that you've made the. the <coughs> what I would say is because because I don't want to talk about protesting here, but I do want to say that, you know, you as you as a responsible helmsman knows what how fast your boat responds, and it may be a good idea to tell the person, I'm going up. I'm trying to get out of your way. This is as fast as I go. Uh, this is as quick as I can do it. You know, and you know just just don't. Don't march slowly on the jib sheet and the main sheet. You know, mm -hmm. do do what you need to do, you know, and and get out of their way. And uh, uh, when that happens, any other questions? Here's another situation to start. We're still on the starting line. Um, <clears throat> in, in position. In position one, blue is, to lure, blue is clear stern. In position two, they're approaching the leeward end of the starting line. Blue is really low. They might not make it. Right. Does yellow have to go up to stay out of their way? No. Yes. As long as blue can make it, because their proper course might be to luff around the pin, okay? The, the fastest way for blue to get to the windward mark after the starting signal, after the starting signal, even though they've come in from behind, would be to luff around that mark and then get on their close off course. Now, if blue kept going, once they got across the starting line, then they would be wrong because then they would not be sailing the proper course. But it is often the case where a, he a heavy displacement boat, for that matter, even light boats, have to luff around marks. And that, you know, if, if again, it's a lured boat, so they can do that, because that is the proper, the proper course is the fastest yeah. way to get to the next mark, the fastest way to get around the course without other boats around you. If, if yellow was not there, it would still be faster for blue to luff around that mark, rather than to do a circle and start. Any other questions about that? No? Okay, we're on the windward leg. Rule 10, very simple. Port tack, keep clear of starboard tack. Now, this rule here at 16.1 says that the yellow boat, in this case, the starboard tack boat, the, the right-of-way boat, <coughs> cannot do anything that would prevent the port tack boat from keeping clear. Okay? So, what about wind ships? What about, you know, I mean, what if there's a, what if, what if there's a 30 degree wind shift? Well, it depends on when it happens. If, if, if port is in the process of crossing starboard and would have made it, anyway, and all of a sudden starboard gets, you know, there's a big lift, starboard cannot simply go up with the lift and say, you fouled me, because port is going to keep clear, so starboard's going to have to hold their course. Now, if the wind shift happens before they're in a situation where port is keeping clear of starboard, like, you know, a couple boat lengths early, then that's different. But if, if port is in the process of passing starboard, then you can't respond. Likewise, if ports, starboard can't hunt port. Sometimes people will, before they even get there, they'll head down. A, star, a starboard tag boat, it's a common tactic in big fleets, especially in dinghies, where a uh, starboard tag boat does not want the port tag boat to cross them, so they'll crack off. But they, had to, they have to do it before port gets there. <laughs> You can't simply do it. And not only that, but when you crack off, as port start, if port decides to cross, now you have to hold your course. You can't start going up and hunting. So 16.1 is protecting, it's, it's a limitation on, this, on the right-of-way boat so that the, the burden boat that's trying to keep clear knows what you're gonna do. So if you're on starboard, it's best to just hold your course. Yes, sir. 
back in the day, you used to be able to yell at the boat, hold your course. If you got a wind ship and you've already made him aware that you're admonishing that he is on starboard tack and he has the right of way, and you scream, hold your course, he doesn't have the right to all of a sudden decide to change course because the wind shifted. Well, any, whether you yell or not, this rule says you don't have the right to change it. <laughs> what the frick am I racing boats for? For God's sakes. Have you met Rick? <laughs> Many times. <laughs> the, um, I'm just smiling. Seriously, <laughs> but seriously, the, um, the holding of the chorus is just something, is, is typically something that the port attack boat will say to. It's basically acknowledging, yes, you have the right of way. I'm going to try and, try and cross you. Um, but whether they say it or not, doesn't change the situation that, you know, the port tech boat has to stay out of the way of the starboard tech boat. The starboard tech boat can't do anything that causes the port tech boat to take even more action to stay out of their way. It's more of a courtesy of the upper end of the fleet because the lower end of the fleet has no clue what you're saying. <laughs> it's just so we got Zach Fromberg and John Dane coming. Okay, Zach's got John. John wants to go to the right, and Zach wants to go to the left. So if, if Zach says, tack, John's going to tack ahead and the Lord, and their, both their game plans are screwed up. So Zach wants to go to the left, John wants to go to the right, and Zach's going to say, cross. Right. He dips tack for cross. Zach, John goes that way, Zach goes that way. It's, at that point, it's, it's tactics, strategy. Okay, um, it, it happens all the time with the really good guys. It, it's a very common thing. As you move down the uh, ladder, I'm on starboard, I own it. And most of the time they're wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, thank you, David. I mean, it's basically if the port tack boat thinks the right side's favored. They want to go there. The starboard <clears throat> tack, tack boat thinks he's wrong. He wants to go left. Not only that, he does not want the port tack boat to tack below him and force him to go the other way. Yeah, go ahead and cross me. Mm -hmm. you know? But if you're a starboard tack boat and you tell them to cross and then you hit them, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're, gonna have, you're gonna be in trouble later a, with I that have person. I have a bowel pulpit that is bent because of, I yeah. called starboard. Yeah, well, <laughs> guess which way it's bent. Yeah. <laughs> so, again, how close is too close? You know, when you're sailing, when you're sailing big boats, and 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 you're, you know, it's it's important to know what you're what you're willing to tolerate about how close you're going to get to another boat. Um, David alluded to, you know, the, the elite, they'll get very close to other boats, and you can find lots of videos online of these 44-foot racing boats that are tacking within inches of each other. Yeah. I doubt you'll be doing that. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, uh, you've got you to gotta have an extremely well-honed uh, crew in order to pull that kind of maneuver off, and also you have to have a very good judgment and... And I'll just say, I'll buy the one shirt. You can have it. Very good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from yeah, bad a, judgment. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so you have to judge, you know, how far apart you are, how big the boats are, what the angle of the boats are to each other. You know, some boats point higher than others. You know, uh, my Catalina only <coughs> tacks in about 120 degrees, maybe 130 <laughs> degrees, something terrible. You know, Mel just 32s tack in 75 or something like that. You know, so you got to watch out. You know, you you got to be careful out there. So now we've sailed upwind. We're getting to the windward mark, and we're going to talk a little bit about mark rounding. In this situation, you got two boats that are coming up, and they're both on the starboard tack with the And the blue boat is to lure it in ahead. And when they get to the windward mark, 
yellow must give blue room to go around that mark. Note that when they get to the zone, blue is ahead. They're the ones, they have room. They're on the inside. So yellow has to give room to blue. To, to blue. They go around the mark. They go downwind. Uh, pretty simple situation. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Yellow is on starboard. Blue is on port coming across. They want the blue tax inside the three boat lane zone. Is blue entitled to room around the mark? No. No. They are not. Because yellow got it first. Yellow, yellow is already there. They cannot tag inside. Well, now, I, if bottom is that the yellow outside and blue is already well inside the, the, the three boat lane? If, if, well, in this case, blue has caused yellow to sail above close hold, okay, in order to get around the mark. I'm not talking about luffing up. Yellow, yellow is on the ley line. So the only way they can go up is to, is to luff. And they're, they're above close hall, of course. Blue is coming in and tacked inside the three le boat length zone. And oh, okay, I'm sorry. And there isn't room, there isn't room for blue to get around unless blue, unless yellow luffs up. Blue has broken the rule. Right. Because right. one of the boats is it is, it is tacked, and again. Another thing to note here, this particular part of the rule is when the mark, when you're approaching a mark to be left to port. Mm. Okay. There's an L1 story about that situation too. There's two, two L1 stories. So if yellow leaves blue room to avoid a collision, they would then protest after the race. Right. The, 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 the thing that you must do is try to, is to avoid the collision right. if you can. Ask for your great group all that. But, right. but um, if, if, if yellow were, instead of being here, was up here, reaching down, and if they were up above the close all course, then, then they would have to give blue room because they would not have to sail above a close all course to go around the mark. See, the thing is, it's above close hall here. Mm -hmm. This is, again, this is at a windward mark. Um, and when you're on opposite tacks at a windward mark, you don't have mark room. I mean, it, there's no room at the mark. It's just port starboard. It's once you're on the same tack that you have room at the mark. And then there's this limitation of tacking inside. <clears throat> again. It's a, a similar situation. <clears throat> Orange sails of, uh, luffs above close hall course to clear the mark. Green has to sail above close hall course as well to go around the mark. And because green had to go up, Orange has broken the rule. You know, until they get there, though, Orange is still a lured boat. It's just when they're going around the mark that, that this is a problem. Now, there's another situation. Blue comes across, sails across yellow's bow, tacks. Yellow sails inside, gets an inside overlap. Blue has to give yellow room. Even though they're inside the, inside the zone, it's because one of them has tacked, you know, blue has tacked inside the zone. So, does everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Starboard rounding. In this case, it's mostly port starboard. If, in this case, it starts off with yellow being on starboard tack. Blue is on port, yellow has a right away. In the second position, yellow 
is now tacky. So blue In this situation, blue lefts to avoid hitting yellow from position three, going around the mark, but because you're leaving it to starboard, the room at the mark does not apply to starboard rounds. But before you get there, it supports starboard. Say that again. I'm sorry. So, so at position one, at position one, it's just starboard port. Yellow is yeah, starboard. Gotcha. Okay. At position two, so this is position two. So blue is still back there. Yellow is up there, right? Oh, I see. Okay. So they're tacking ahead, basically. And then once they're once they're on the close haul course, they can then luff up afterwards and get room around the mark yeah. because you're, because you, because you are going around it to starboard instead of port. I know it's a very confusing rule. <laughs> so my recommendation is don't tack inside the zone. Get on your ley lines before you get there to the zone and it's a much safer rounding. Any questions about that? Is this confusing? This one is, this drawing is bad. <clears throat> it's not a very good drawing. Yeah. This is more of a match racing thing, yeah. starboard roundings. Well, sometimes unfortunately, we'll have one this slate. is not a good drawing because you have one and one coming in, then you got two and two. Yellow is tacking, and, and, and blue's obviously got full steam ahead. Okay, we'll do it over here. Two is tacking, but it looks like two is right next to three, but the yellow three is ahead of the blue three. Okay. So all I can tell you is <laughs> doing a bunch of match racing where you round the starboard to make it more interesting. <clears throat> when that starboard boat's coming in, give them room. If you have a boat on port tack over here. Can yeah, you see? Sure because we do that a lot here in the Corinthians. We do we go around. starboard round. Right. A board on port tack is here. Another boat on starboard tack is here, coming in here. Simple port starboard. There's no requirement that this boat tacks when they get there. If this boat is coming across on port, they just have to stay out of their way. If you're bow to bow, port's going to, what, what, what you can either tack to stay out of their way, yeah. luff your sail to slow down so that you don't have to do many maneuvers to get around the mark. But the bottom line is you got to stay out of their way. The issue that is come that that drawing over there, which was not very simple, was and I'm going to move these lines out of the way right here. Those are the zone lines. If you have a port tack boat and a starboard tack boat comes in and tacks below them right here inside the zone you know as they're tacking let's assume that starboard did a clean i mean when port sorry when the starboard tack boat tacked below them it was a clean tack that they didn't interfere with the with the boat that was already on port now it's a windward lured when they get to the mark this boat needs to luff up this boat needs to stay out of their way and it doesn't matter whether they were in the zone or not because they're leaving it to starboard. That special rule about being in the zone tacking is only for port tack rounding. And it is the majority of the roundings you're gonna do. And, and the match racing issue that he brought up is not likely to happen with Corinthians, 
but you will possibly be going the other way around. All right, that, that's what, because they, they do the opposite way of your bed. Yeah, <clears throat> depends on the wind direction, you know. It's, it's coming from the south, uh, southeast, I guess. Yeah. Okay. And again, touching a mark. That, well, technically not part of part two. <laughs> Uh, when boats meet, um, does everybody know what you do when you touch a mark? First of all, don't don't touch L1 <laughs> or M1. <laughs> but uh, prepare the sails. Prepare the sails. Get a new boat. All sorts of things like that. Um, so if you touch a mark, you simply have to do a 360 to exonerate yourself. And, a, and, a, and a, a single turn is a tack and a jibe. That's the way it's defined, in the same direction. Um, and not only that, but you have to get clear of everybody else. So if you're in the, let's say you just hit the mark and you're in traffic and you decide to do your circle, if in the process do, of doing your circle, other boats are coming up on you, you have picked the wrong place to do your circle. <laughs> you need to get clear. And you also need to do it immediately. You can't wait till you're halfway down the leg. You have to immediately work yourself clear. You know, if, if, especially if it's like if 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 it's a um, a CSA race where it's a short a short windward leg and everybody's at L1, let's say. So there are a lot of boats there. It could be a while before you can do your circle, but you have to start getting clear immediately. Okay. It's my understanding that you have to do your circle at the I don't at the mark, but but stay clear. Right. I mean, you you can't. In other words, you can't wait till it's convenient. Right. You have to get away from other boats, right. so that when you do your circle, you don't foul anybody. Basically, they don't have to. When you're doing your circle, they don't have to stay out of your way. But you don't have to go around the mark. No. Correct. You get clear. It used to be a long time ago that you had to reround it. They decided to get rid of that because it is when you have a big fleet, it's very congested and it actually causes more trouble. So when you, when you hit the mark, right, and you have to work your way around, you have to work your way sideways so that you're not back down the course when you're finally free and then do your three sixty. It, there's no there's no uh, requirement to be anywhere on the race course. You just have to be clear of other boats. Okay. So. Once you know, if you have if you have touched it, um, then you have to then you have to do your circle. You also have to go around it. So a, a typical situation is that you almost make the mark and you touch it on the way around it. to go around, and you actually haven't gone around it yet. Now you have to go around it and do your circle. Okay, but the point is that you need to get clear of other boats. So you know, if you've already gone around the mark, you know, and you hit it, and you've got boats to windward and no boats to leeward, well, it might be better to go down and do a circle. But if most of the boats are down to leeward of you, you might want to just head up wind a bit, do a circle there. Um, another thing to watch out for is you are not alone on the race course, and there are other boats that are coming up from behind. So if you, in the process of doing your circle, you're still going around, you haven't finished it, and a boat goes around the mark and is suddenly there, that's a problem. So you do have to anticipate that. Yes. We have a comment on here. To yes. Just do a time check. Yes. Uh, to watch that we uh, cover finish line before the meeting ends. That's a good idea. We want to finish before we finish. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, I'll talk briefly about a continuing obstruction that is a very seldom used situation where you have a shoreline um, or, or like a seawall or you know a long dock or something. It, it's not common <coughs> around here. But basically, very simply, if you're trying to go between a boat and say a shoreline, at the time you start, if you don't have an overlap. And you want to get there at the time you establish at the time you establish your overlap. There has to be room for you to do it. And then once you're in there, 
the, the room situation is similar to going around. A shoal would qualify. A shoal well. does qualify as a continuous obstruction. The spoil bank out in the in you know Great on the way to, on the way to Gulf Yeah. Boy. So in this situation, you know, you've got one, uh, the, the yellow in position one, yellow uh, tries to come in and then, you know, uh, blue has to give them room because there's, there's room to do it at the time. However, in this situation, because there's not enough room, for blue to go in there in the first place because the boom is too wide or if spinnaker is too wide or whatever, then they can't go in on a continuum. As long as there's room for it to pass at the moment the overlap is a step begins, then they're entitled to room. Okay. All right, when it comes to downwind, you've got proper course, and overlaps, et cetera. What is a proper course? Does anybody know what a, who wants to give me a definition of proper course? No line. That's one. Yes, of course you would sail if there are no other boats around to get around fast. Exactly. Exactly. So you've got sport boats. The rum line is not the fastest way around. They're gonna they're gonna want to sail a lot higher than that. For that matter, a boat with spinnaker may be able to sail a lot lower than a boat without one. And who, dis who determines what proper course is? The right-of-way boat does. So if, if you're going to windward of me, and I'm, and I decide I want to go that way because that's the fastest way, then you have to stay out of my way. However, I cannot claim, oh, because you're on, you know, you're to windward of me, blanketing me, I can now go up because that's my proper course. No. You know, I, I, I'm sorry. If I come in, come in from behind you to Lourdes, I can't go up claiming you blocked my wind and say that's my proper course. It has to be if you weren't there at all. That's what determines it. So here we have a situation where you've got blue coming in from the stern. So blue would not go up if yellow weren't there, they would just keep going. But blue decides to go up, blue has now broken the, the rule. Is that clear? Yeah. Now, here's another situation. You got a bunch of uh, boats that are fairly slow. You know, there happens to be an opti fleet out there for some reason it's unknown to you and they're going very slow and you're coming up and blue even though they establish an overlap to lure wants to go above them why because they do it even if yellow wasn't there but they also can get room from yellow they can force yellow up even though you know because that is the proper course so they can force them up Now, in this case, this is a tricky situation, and I'm just going to skip over it because it's a tactical thing that sometimes people do where they'll sail so far away so that the overlap doesn't happen until they get close. But ask me about this afterwards. We're going to skip this. Um, let's see. Okay. Overlaps, you can have overlaps if you're on opposite tacks. That is something that is fairly recent in the history of the rules, has been around for about a dozen years now, maybe a little longer. But if, if you have boats on opposite jives, if you're more than 90 degrees from the, uh, from the wind, you can be overlapped. You're still on opposite tacks, but the overlap rules still, uh, you're still overlapped. And that's, so in this case, you see how yellow jives, right? They're still overlapped. Does jiving create new overlap though? Uh, if you... Well, every time, yes. So actually 
in this particular situation, again, this is tricky and I, I want to keep things fairly um, basic. So I'm going to, I just want to mention that you can have an overlap on opposite jives and that's important when it comes to room at the mark when you're going downwind. When you get close enough to a mark, if you're on opposite jives, if you're the starboard tack boat and a port tack boat says room and you're within three boat lengths, you can't say I'm a starboard tack boat because it's room at the mark. Um, let's see. Let's Let's talk about the lured mark here. So here's an interesting situation. Blue is at the, at the zone, three boat lengths. See where the line goes? <laughs> Way over there. So it, so it has, so that means that yellow can call for room on blue because they are inside. Even though they're on opposite jobs. Are they on? Yes, they're on opposite jives. Okay, so here's here's a situation at the lured mark. And let's say we're going around twice. Um, so they're going to be going back upwind. In this situation, green is the inside boat because at the time that the first boat gets in the zone, there's a three-way overlap. So blue, even though it does not have, uh, green does not have an overlap on blue alone, it does by extension. You might have heard me refer to a pinwheel before. That's when you get a whole lot of boats at a lured mark trying to go around at the same time. This is a situation where you have three, three, three boats. Um, now, Blue and yellow must give green space to sail to the mark. Okay, everybody understand that? In this case, same situation, except now green is a lured boat. Because Chris, what happens if because blue, gets on top, blue gets on top of the wave and, and goes an extra boat and half length ahead of the other two guys because he's sailing better or whatever and breaks the overlap. Well, at the time they enter the zone, those two, the or the, at the time they enter the zone, yellow and green have to, uh, blue has to give yellow and green room, which means all the way to the mark. It doesn't matter what happens after that because at the time blue got there, there was an overlap. If they surf on a wave and break it, then they're, they could certainly try to get there. I mean, if they, if they can get around the mark, clear ahead of them, then that's fine. But what if, what if yellow then, you know, they surf, blue surfs, then yellow surfs at the last second, blue's got to give them room. Blue has to plan on giving room to two boats in this case. Gotcha. Okay, so in this situation, you got boats on opposite jives. So yellow is a starboard tack boat, and they are they have a right of way until blue gets to the zone, and then blue must give room to. Uh, I'm sorry, blue is right away over yellow. Blue has to give room to yellow once they get to the zone because that's the the mark room rule turns on. Here's another situation where you have to jive around the lured mark. Again, with mark room, uh, yellow must jive at the mark. They may not keep going past the mark. They, they're, they're, this, their, their proper course is to go around the mark and go upwind, or maybe, maybe it's not go upwind, but at least go around the mark. They cannot just keep going. In that scenario, if the yellow is boom, it's blue. One can assume that blue did not give enough room. But it also depends on the type of rounding. If, 
if for whatever reason yellow was you know so far away from the mark okay. that another boat were able to get inside blue could claim hey you, you took too much room but but you're right yellow uh, blue has to give yellow enough room to do whatever maneuver they need all right does everybody see here that red does not have any room whatsoever <laughs> Look at the number of boats between the mark and red. There are three of them. That's how, that's how wide the zone is. This is a common occurrence in a big fleet. When boats are getting to the lured mark and they start lining up, sometimes they'll slow down. As you mentioned before, Rick, I think, you know, can you slow down and go behind them? Yeah. And then meanwhile, another boat's behind you slowing down and another boat's behind them slowing down. And a fourth boat comes in in this situation you know, if if if, if uh, green, yellow, and blue slowed down enough, and let's say, you know, uh, let's say red was up course more towards there, they might try to get in, saying, "Hey, look, I'm inside." Like, but at the time they got there, they didn't have room. The prudent thing to do would be for yellow and blue to point to red and say, "I'm in the zone, no room." Don't have to say that, but I can. I've had to do that racing in big fleets before when you know, I'll actually get to the situation where there's a whole lot of boats and I don't want to go on the outside because I'll be five boat lengths of lured of the lured mark. So I'm going downwind in my sunfish, I'll put my board down, I'll turn my sail in all the way, even though I'm going straight downwind and the boat almost comes to a complete halt and the boats behind me are blanketing me, but I'm in the zone and I say, Albert, no room and you can't come in. And most people are going to be, yeah, please don't come inside in the Catalina. <laughs> okay, the finish. Good. Okay, so rule 18 is in effect at the finish line. It's not in effect at the start, but it is in effect at the finish. So as you can see here, blue is a limited boat. So they they don't have the right of way over the over yellow the lured boat, but when they get within within the zone three boat lengths of in this case it's the committee boat they can ask for room to finish. Now, how do you finish? You you. Up the part of your hull crosses the finish line. That's how. <clears throat> Do you have to go all the way across the line? No. You can you can clear yourself from the finish line in any direction. You can you as long as one part of your boat pierces that line, you can then let's say you're finishing upwind, your bow pierces the line, the bar is over here. You don't want to go that far. You don't want to go all the way around the, you know, M1 because it's faster to just turn around. You can do that. And it's the hull, not the hull. Yeah. yeah, actually, for starting and finishing, by the way, we didn't talk about this earlier, but I, the, the rule for this quadrennium changed to the part of the hull that crosses the line, not your, not your, uh, not any part of the superstructure. So not your spinnaker, not your bow pulpit, not your bow sprit, your hull. So, um, you know, if uh, it used to be like I, I sailed 470s a long time ago, and those are, those are trapeze boats. And it used to be you had to be very careful at the start not to go out of the wire too soon because you might be over early. Nowadays, that doesn't matter as long as the hull is behind the line. It's actually a pretty common sense thing. It's a lot easier. And it used to be also that you had to, if you're starting, if you're calling a finish line, you had to see where the leading edge of the spinnaker is, which might be 30 feet up in the air. It's really hard to call. Nowadays, you just look at the bow. Doesn't matter. Most of the time, it's about. I have seen people finish backwards before. <laughs> um, if you hit, if you foul somebody, or if you if you touch the finishing mark, or if you foul somebody in the process of finishing, you have to exonerate yourself. In the case of hitting a finish mark, you do a circle. If you have, if the 720 rules in effect and you need to do two circles, then you do your circles. You can do them anywhere. 
However, before you finish, you have to go to the course side of the finish line completely and then cross the finish line from that direction. So you can, in this case, you see that this boat has hit the finish line and just done a dive and attack and now they're just gonna finish. Well, they could have done it up here. Because they have to keep clear of the finish Yeah, there might be other boats that maybe that boat, maybe, maybe there are six boats just to lower it, they can't really do it yet. Yes. You're saying you're saying you wouldn't have to go back around and then cross the line again. You can just do a, do a loop later on. Well, what I'm saying is, in order you exonerate yourself, yeah. and then you finish, because if you finish, if you if you if you foul on the finish line, you have not completely cleared, and you have to finish properly. So in this case, if you touch a finish mark before clearing the finish line, you do it one turn penalty and then go to the course side before finishing and the definition of finishing is is crossing line you know the start the finish line with your with your hull yes do you have to round the mark and you do um if you you've done it outside you've, you've come through and you've hit the mark you, can, you, you just outside, have to get you have to get on the course side no mm -hmm. you do not have to round the mark Okay, so the, the definition of finishing is going between that between the two finish marks. One of them is usually a boat, mm -hmm. and the other one is usually a mark. So you've done your thing, you just sail down, do right. a quick dip, and go back yeah. up across. You know, if, if 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 your finish line is right here, and you hit this mark right here, you can go up here, do your circle, go down there, and then finish. Okay, so just dip. You do not back. have to go around. All right, fair enough. That's too bad. It's a, it's a windward finish. In this case, it's a windward yeah, finish. But, but, but it, you know, typically you'll have a load. If you have a lured finish, the same thing happens. The same thing is in effect. So if you're going downwind and you clip the finish mark, you, you do your circle. And in that case, you have to tack to get up onto the course. Right. You know, so. Okay, any part of the boat, if I cross the finish line, Two feet away from the mark, and I come down and brush it. And our bow is crossed on the finish. Um, you you must clear the line without hitting that mark. Oh, so you have to get completely clear of the line. So, if if for example you finish and it looks like you know, let's say you finish, but you're I'm you're going, going upwind. I'm going for that beer. You're going upwind, <laughs> and 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 you cross the line, and you get headed, and when you get headed, now you're pointing at the mark. Well, you, if as long as you've crossed the line, you can just dip. You're done. You can clear the line in any direction. But there are uh, there's one limitation to that, um, and that's <laughs> this one right here. In position one or in position two, rather. Uh, you know, blue has finished the race. Okay, they they are, they finish up by the committee boat, and they start sailing down. And lo and behold, here comes here comes yellow marching along on port tack. But in this case, it doesn't matter what tack they're on because uh, blue in position three has interfered with yellow. Blue is no longer racing, but at one point they were, and blue can be. Uh, can be penalized because of that. So what would be the penalty? Um, they could be disqualified. Oh. Um, okay. At that point, you've already finished. You can't do a 360 or anything. You can't. You can't undo. You can't undo your finish at that point. Okay. So um, I'm going to double like check it. and make sure that what I said is true. Be nice. Be nice. All right. Okay. So penalties, real quickly, and then and then we're done. Um, a two turns penalty is is two tax and two jibes. Um, a lot of times, that rule is in effect at all times, unless there's uh, unless there's Appendix B, which says you can do just one in certain cer certain instances. But um, the you may not take a two turns penalty if there's 
one of two different things. If there's serious damage or injury, or if you gain a significant advantage. So clearly, if, if you if you damage somebody else's boat seriously, and serious is where it requires repair, typically, um, then you must retire. You cannot take that. You cannot you take just that. spin in the water and go toodaloo. Well, you, you will be saying toodaloo. Yeah. <laughs> They'll keep going and you won't. Um, and also, uh, if, if, if it's to your advantage to follow another boat, a typical example is coming into the windward mark with no rights whatsoever and forcing your way in to lure of all those boats and ending up ahead of 15 boats instead of behind 15 boats and then doing a, doing your circles you can't do that because now you've gained because, because you've broken the rules and you might be subject to a rule you know to a fair sailing rule protest if you do that as well which you don't want to get into that's all and I want to thank U.S. Sailing for providing most of this presentation. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, question, and I actually finish. This is more related to how we sail with the time with the uh, staggered starts. With what? I'm sorry. The staggered starts. Yes. Okay. All these rules apply equally once the race has started. With the staggered start, when does the race start? For each and, boat. And okay. So the duration of the start is really from the nominal time until the last boat So, starts. So I mean, first of all, you know, let, let's talk about... Not real racing, what you're going to say, right? The boats, the boats are all going to be milling about. Right. Okay, so for the most part, we're, we're, you know, the situation at the starting line is, is it is before the starting signal. So earlier on in the presentation, I was talking about, you know, keeping out of the way of the boats. You know, if there's a boat that's checking the wind, they're an obstruction. If they're just sitting there, there's a boat to lure of you. You say, hey, I need room to get around. You know, Rick, Rick is looking at the wind and I want to go behind him. You know, or, hey, I want to tack on this side. Um, but for the most part, it's before the start. And if, um, well, if the starting time is 12 o'clock, and if you're milling around or whatever, the first boats that are starting at 12 o'clock, you got to be clear of those guys because they're racing. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you may still be milling around. Yeah. Starting the box. Yeah. Well, you're, you're setting yourself up for your start as well. But so you're racing. Is, you have not. So you so there's a starting signal. Your starting signal is going to be different from Brian's starting signal. So you know the fact that you don't have a boat out there tooting a horn or anything is immaterial. Your, your starting signal is your time is on the sheet. Yeah. Uh, for I know that I've run races, uh, I've run the, the pursuit uh, return to New Orleans for the, for the uh, Southern Yacht Club's Mandeville race. Mm -hmm. We actually had a committee boat out there tooting the horn for each and every boat. Mm -hmm. And we we're making sure they weren't over early. Also making sure they had their safety equipment and things like that. But the, but the starting signal for you is your start. And if, it's, if you haven't started yet, and Brian hasn't started yet. You both are before the start. Right, so you bring up a good point. How long have you got to run your engine before you're into your, your starting sequence? Five minutes? The rules state that you're, you, that the rules go into effect at the preparatory signal. And for a pursuit start, I'm not sure what the definition is for that. Same. Is it the same four minutes? So for, for the starts that we're going to do, we didn't go over the starting procedure here at all, but for a, for a, for a, a timed start that, that LPRC is going to be using, the, uh, the warning signal, which is when the class flag goes up, is at five minutes before the start, and the preparatory signal, which is when the rules go into effect, is at four minutes before the start. And that's for what you're going to do. now. For the pursuit start, I'm not. I don't know. They might define it Wait, as such. Five, four, and then another five. Yeah. Your class. Yeah. Uh -huh. So it's it's just like a class break. If we're doing races, that for us we've got boats starting multiple times. So the, we just have to stay clear of the starting box. If you're not starting, stay outside of that area, which gives those boats. Clearance to get but in there. My concern is 
how long can you run the engine? Until the preparatory signal. Which is four minutes before your starting time. Before your starting time. Right. Oh, okay, so you're willing your five minutes. You can run your engine for the last minute if you had to, charge your batteries or something, <laughs> and then four minutes you start. Or kick the turbo in. Yeah, yeah kick the right, turbo right. in. <laughs> or you're running the pina colada machine. And right. You gotta do what you gotta do. You know, sometimes. Well, you can run your engine, but it doesn't have to, as long as it's not in gear. Right. Well, that's, right. Exactly. Yeah, that's a totally other subject, right. but, but to answer your question, I don't know what your sailing instructions, CSA sailing instructions say about what constitutes the preparatory signal. Yeah. So whatever that, whatever, I mean, the rule states that the, that the, 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 the racing rules of sailing go into effect at the time of the, the preparatory signal. And another thing to note is that if, when you are not racing, and I said this at the beginning, when you are not racing at all, or if you encounter another boat that was never racing, you know, you know, out there cruising around, just the the uh, uh, the rules for preventing collisions is in effect. You cannot luff somebody up who's not racing. <laughs> if if they were racing, if they were racing, you know, before, then they should get out of your way because now they're interfering. If you're racing and they're not racing, now they're interfering with you. So, so. Can, can, can I just suggest something on the engine? Yes. Uh, I leave my engine running until after the start. I mean, crazy stuff happens out there. We don't have a committee boat. We don't have a pin of many, many times. Yeah. And I just leave it in idle. I mean, we're very much in the honor system anyway. Mm -hmm. And just, just leave, it, leave it in idle until after the yeah. But not in gear. Yeah. Okay, right. Yeah. yeah. Not right. in reverse. I mean, I mean, yeah. In, in, in not in gear, but yes. Yeah. So if something were to happen, you throw it in gear, get out of space, yeah, 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 avoid a collision. Yeah. Right. Chris, is the pursuit race similar to the CSA uh, stagger start? Well, a pursuit race is, is exactly what we're talking about. It's a, it's a synonym. So it's what do you do in a pursuit race for that preparatory time? I don't recall because I'd have to. I don't remember what the sailing surgeon right, said. I mean, it's four minutes before. Sense. it's typically four minutes before the start. But like like uh, college sailing and and opties have a three minute sequence. It's totally different. You know, um, uh, the Barrington Frost Quiet Association up in Rhode Island that sails crazy people that sail all winter have a two minute sequence. So you know, it, it depends on what you want to do. So you can you can write your own starting sequence, but. System, you know, Rule 26 in the in the rule book has a five-minute sequence, and it's and uh, the first the first thing that happens is the class flag going up, and then one minute later, one of the preparatory signals there are many goes up, and that's when the rules go into effect. So when LPRC goes into class, so you should stay out of the way until your yes. class code. So once you do that, uh, and you're in your your, your five-minute window. Class, do the racing rules apply before? I mean, the, the starboard, blue, or everything. Yeah, the racing blue, rules. Report? The racing rules do not apply until the preparatory signal. Once you are racing, then they apply. Now, if if you are out there intending to race and you interfere with a boat that is racing, that's an interference thing. So if if you're sailing class C yeah. and a class B boat is getting ready to start. And it's you know they're in their they're in their sequence and you meander under their course and they have to do something, you could get thrown out, yeah. or penalized or something something, and or definitely yelled at. <laughs> <laughs> yes. you know, I had a crazy thing happen. I don't know if you've ever heard this. It was in a race a long long time ago. We hit the mark. We had to get out of the way, off the course, wait for everybody to pass, and then round the marker twice. And then go through. Have you ever heard of that? No. Yes, yeah, strange. I've never seen it before. After then. So. That's an old road. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, well, what's happening? That's new. Don't want to end this. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. 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 Yeah.